Matt Mooney, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing, mate? I'm good. How are you two? We are very, very good. We're excited to have you on, Paul, because yeah. the last time I spoke to you and saw you properly was many years ago, and since then oh. you've you've exploded. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> it's about seven years ago, you know. It's got to be. It's got to be. So I'm Thank really guys. excited to find out about that journey, and I sent all the three questions across to you to try and find out more about that. So I think there's tons of it that listeners will get out today. Yeah, we all go back a long way, don't we? So it's uh, it's nice to catch up. I was actually thinking the other day, Matt, I don't know if you remember this or not, but the first time you and I met, you hadn't actually started Profit yet. We were all at Snowden, and I think you'd been invited along because you were waiting to start the week one course or something, and me and you ended up in the same room, and I'd only just started, and you were waiting to start. And uh, ah, that was the, no way. Oh, I didn't remember the first, that. That's the first time we met. It was on one of them crazy it's Snowden funny. trips. <laughs> That Snowden meeting obviously was the first time I met everybody. So I was like dead nervous trainer at like, what was I? 18, 19, 19, 20, whatever I was, 20. Um, yeah. And I like set off really early. I stayed over the night before. So I got to the car park about an hour early and I just sat in my car and nothing was happening. And it got to about 15 minutes before the meet time. I was like, still nobody here. And then it got to like the hour and then about half an hour passed. And I was like, what the hell's going on here? I was like, surely not everybody can be late. And then I got a call from Paddy. He was like, all right, man, just checking where you are. I was like, yeah, I'm in the car park. And it turns out it was a different car park that was about 100 metres down. So I ended up being the absolute last one, pulled in last minute, and then we all set <laughs> Perfect preparation and all that. Yeah, That's having it, been a yeah. day early, he ended up late. <laughs> yeah, it's only, I couldn't believe it. It was people who'd literally just gotten up and driven down that day who beat me. <laughs> God, so you two were roomies on a Snowden trip. Yeah, yeah, back then, yeah, yeah, I, re I remember oh, that's class. Me, me and Matt in, in that room, he's like, hi, I'm Matt, hi, I'm Matt, so that was easy to remember. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Give people a bit of an idea, Matt, as to your journey into the industry then, because obviously we, we know how it all began and that, but for those that don't know you, like, how did you end up getting into PT and, and all of that? Just give us a background of what, what your fitness career has been like, because it's obviously gone off in a, a different direction since your PT days. Yeah, absolutely. So my kind of like fitness career started at right at the beginning of my career, really. So I went to school and then went to college. I actually got into fitness because I got bullied in secondary school was the reason. So my confidence was like absolutely rock bottom. I was stick thin. So I was like, right, I'm going to join the gym when I started going to college. And then I really got into it. I was training, you know, a couple of hours a day as best as you can as a 17 year old teenager, not knowing what you're doing. Um, and I really started to get into it. Then I got a weekend job, which was working in the post office and I'd sit and read men's health and just generally got down the rabbit hole of fitness. And then with being 17, 18, testosterone's through the roof. So you got really good results really quick. And I was like, oh, this is working. I like this. So as I was in college, I don't know why, but I just did not want to go to uni. There was just no part of me that wanted to go to uni. Like I was fairly bright. I'd get like A's and B's in lessons. But I just didn't want to go. So my actual plan was to join the police. And I was actually completed my application to the special constables. And then <laughs> there was in my local gym, there was a PT who worked there and he had a really nice car and he seemed to just love his life, just working and going in and training clients. So I was like, oh, I wonder if I could do that, which is when I researched to become a PT. And then literally, I think I was meant to start training for the police. And then last minute, decided to train to be a PT instead joined uh what were they called premier training at the time i don't think they exist anymore who taught me to become a pt and then while i was there there was zach cotton and josh McHale, and everybody around were looking for jobs of where they were going to go and those two were just absolutely certain they were going to profit because they knew andy hibbert so i was like well they're certain so i may as well join profit as well so yeah joined profit and then i was at profit for three years about 18 months into that, I started setting up an online, I call it an online weight loss business, but it was much more sporadic and unorganized than that. But the correct term would be uh, an online weight loss business for women. So I started that about 18 months into my time at Profit. I think I got about 20 clients and started to bring in about 700 quid a month from that. And then being the naive 19 year old, I was like, right, that's it. I'm going to be a millionaire. Time to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> quit profit with literally bringing in about 700 quid a month and i think i quit in about the september october november something like that 
signed up a few clients, maybe got it to about a grand a month. They had no savings behind me. I was living at home with my parents, but, um, and then the January hit, and then I was hit with something like a seven grand tax bill, which <laughs> I'd not saved any of the money towards. So I think I had all these like visions and hopes and dreams that positive thinking was all that you need. And as long as you think positive, you're going to succeed. And then it was a very harsh reality of having no money coming in having a crap product that I was selling and a massive tax bill that kind of hit me in the side of the head and taught me, you know what, maybe it's not all about thinking positive and rah-rah. So I think after about six months, I was like, right, I need a form of revenue. So after the mistake of leaving PT the first time, I thought, right, now maybe I should start something else. So I went back to PT, built up another client base, but I purposely did it on just three days a week. So I kind of got myself to a full-time client base of doing 10, 12 clients a day, but only on three days a week. Now, the original plan was to build up my online weight loss business for women. It was called the Lighter Ladies, which is a horrific name. <laughs> so the original plan was to build that up. But I kind of realized I didn't actually have any passion specifically for helping women to lose weight because I'm not a woman. Like I enjoyed working with female clients in person, but it was a bit different doing it online when you're talking about it all day, every day. Um, and it was around that time I got back into mountain biking. So Sophie, my other half, bought me a mountain bike. I started riding loads and loads and then realized that there was a real gap in the mountain bike market for fitness for mountain bikers. So the biggest person at the time had about 3,000 followers on Facebook, I think it was at the time, and there was just nobody else. And I was like, right, there's definitely an opening here. So I started MTB Fitness about, I don't know, seven years ago, something like that. And then it's just grown from there. So I'll let you ask any questions if you want, because I've been talking for quite a while, but I'm more than happy to elaborate on any and all of that. <laughs> That might be one of the most detailed and interesting explanations of a background we've ever had on the show. So that was really good. <laughs> yeah. can, really can, informative. Can you imagine Matt as a, a policeman? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be getting punched and I'd be like, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Let's talk about it again. Whack. Oh, come on. We can talk about this. <laughs> I think, that, when just, you, I think you just when, talk them to death, give them like yeah. the reasons why they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. I mean, when you when you look back on your life at like little decisions that you made that made all the difference, like that's one of them right there, isn't it? Like that little last minute switch to going down that PT route instead. Like obviously you yeah. never know what would have happened, but it's amazing when you boil boil someone's life down into that few minutes and you're like, wow, look at that impact that decision yeah. made. But yeah, 100%. especially at that age, because you're so young, at 16, 17, and you're meant to decide the trajectory of your life and you don't know what you like or who you are. So obviously I got into fitness, but then it's taken, you know, a, a turn as you grow up and know what you're into. But such a huge decision. I think so many people just make that decision at 17 and then do it for the rest of the life. And you have no idea what you like at that age. I think that's something I'd like to ask about. I mean, listen to your background and everything there. Um and it, be, kind of before we do, one of the topics we really wanted to get into, which was um, one of Matt's suggestions, which I think was a class idea to go into, is your first year of growing MTB um, and what that was like. But leading up to MTB, you've got a really interesting journey there because you had a lot of kind of to in and fro in, having a go at something shitty name like lighter life or whatever it was <laughs> what was it lighter, lady lighter ladies yeah i was like right i'm training ladies and they want to be lighter right i know <laughs> yeah like you've you've got a lot of really twists and turns there that did it put you off did it did it knock you back was it just a case of you going these are just decisions i've got to make i've just got to get through them because i think a lot of people get stuck in that zone where they're kind of going they're overthinking it they're not making any decisions. They keep stalling themselves. They don't make any progression. That that paralysis by analysis, you don't seem to have that. You just seem to crack on. I think I do crack on mostly. Right. But I think at the time, I definitely felt embarrassed and ashamed and like a failure. And I had all of those emotions. And it wasn't that I'm just Mr. Positive anyway and I can crack on. I think it was just the you just kind of you're in a hole a hole which it wasn't that bad at the time like looking back it wasn't that bad but at the time you know owing like five grand to the tax man whatever it was and 
feeling like you know everything had imploded you feel like your life is over now it doesn't seem that bad bad looking back at it but at the time it felt like a, you know it was just a failure um I remember the time when I decided to become a PT I think I was obviously realizing that I wasn't doing very well and I did go for a period actually where I probably got a bit depressed I remember my mum commenting I was staying at home where there was a few weeks where I'd started lying in till like nine, 10 o'clock in the day and not getting out of bed. So mm. I probably did go through a period of a few weeks where I was feeling crappy. And then I remember going for a walk up to a golf course near me and I was sat on a hill and I was looking down at the gym that I used to train at where I saw the PT that inspired me to become a PT. I was like, I know, why not just go and do some PT there and start building up? So I can't say I joined there with, you know, real positive thinking. It was just a matter of, I'm not doing very well right now. I need to do something. I need to do better. I knew how to become a PT. You know, I obviously got plenty of clients off the back of training with Profit. So I did that. So I do think I definitely struggle with the negative emotions and stuff like that. I just have to kind of like force myself to keep going, even when you think it's not working, if that makes sense. How how do you do that? Because I think that's really interesting for people to listen to. Because when you first described it, that's why I wanted to dig into it a bit more, because it kind of, your first description of it there was very like, I just, I did this and I did this and I did this. And some people could maybe brush over that as going, you know, he's just got that attitude where he's a go, he's a, a go get him person. But then the second explanation doesn't sound like that's the case. It's more, what did you do when you were in those tough spots to actually go, this isn't the end. This is just another, another place to get through. Yeah. I think a lot of it was probably instilled from the time at profit. And I guess looking back, I think I started watching a lot of Gary V, which at the time really helps. And he was obviously talking about all that sort of stuff. So I probably right. had all of those positive influences. So it probably didn't come from within. It was probably more a matter of reading books about, you know, Tony Robbins, that type of stuff, Gary V. So I think I had those influences and I've got quite an addictive, almost like a slightly like autistic personality. I'm probably somewhere slightly on the spectrum, to be honest. So I'm quite like obsessive with stuff. So if I go down a rabbit hole of starting to learn about self-improvement, I won't just like read a book. I'll obsess over it and I'll be like, right, in my ears all the time. I've got to have it in my ears. I'll learn all about it. So I think it was probably probably from being at ProFit, taught me a few of those things to listen to, and then I'll absolutely obsess over it. So I don't think it was just came from within that I just need to crack on and be successful. It was more a matter of having those influences. I think the other side of it as well, so I grew up in a house, so my mum and dad... Um, my mum was a teacher and she didn't really like, not that she didn't like teaching, but it was a hell of a big workload and she got really overwhelmed with it and suffered with the mental health because of it. And my dad right. really suffered with his mental health because of work as well. So I think most people have a connection of having a real job as safety and security, whereas my connection with having a real job was misery. So for me, going and getting a real job was just never an option. It was always, I have to make it work on my own as self-employed. So you've got to go forward in some way. So I think it was probably those influences of Gary Vee and people like that. And then it never felt like it was an option to go and get an actual job for me. It never has done. I've just, I will always be self-employed or have my own business. I think that's really cool. I think that's, hope. well, not what I was hoping to get to, but just wanted that that answer to, for people to hear. It's almost like a, a burn the boats mentality sometimes. That's my only option. That's where I'm going because of what you've experienced before. And then and that immersion, getting into it and really going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw myself into it. It's not my toes going in. My whole body's going in. Everything's going to go into this so that I know, you know, I know what I need to do next, even when you're down, which, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's hard to do. It's really hard yeah. to do. And I think it's definitely, I don't want people to think I never get down and don't have periods of time where I'm unproductive because it was years ago now, but there were definitely probably weeks where I wasn't being productive and I do a bit of work and then you're on Facebook or procrastinating going on, you know, my Xbox or whatever. Um, but then I think you hit a point where you've got to just crack on and, and move forward, haven't you? One thing for me, it doesn't necessarily help for everyone, but I've always found long walks help. I need a bit of time to be quiet and think things through. And for me, going for a walk is that time where I'll head out for an hour, an hour and a half. I'll often just go and sit on a hill and just think. And I think when you're quiet and you don't have social media constantly scrolling through stuff, I think then you'll come up with a solution because you've got all of this positive stuff that you've read and listened to, but you kind of need to 
let that build in your mind, I think. And for me, that time comes when I'm quiet and I'm totally on my own. I'll never really come up with solutions speaking to someone. I have to just be on my own and think it through. And it was like when I was sat on that hill and saw the gym, I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Then the next day I was in there asking for an interview and then it kind of snowballed and you do it. So I think it's thinking, right, this is a this is a solution that could work right, I'm going to take action on it now and then just going for it. And I remember I joined the gym and just as luck would have it, I literally walked into the gym on my first day and a really successful PT who was the only one in there had left and I walked in and the first person I saw was like, oh, you're a personal trainer, I need one. And I was like, oh, here we go. And then, you know, signed up clients really fast because I'd done it for three years, but you just have to kind of think this might work and then try it and it might not work but at least you've done something then and I think on that note getting out of a bit of like a depressive spiral of not doing much I think you just have to decide something and then take one positive action and as soon as you've done one you're like oh that works and then you walk in the front door of the gym and get a client and you're like oh we're on here I've got one I'm going to speak to 20 more people then you do that and it kind of spirals so I think probably the key to getting loads of productivity is just starting with one or two things when you really don't feel like it. Yeah, yeah. that's class, that's class mm-hmm. advice. Really good. Yeah. And I know, like I, I just mentioned then, like that's that's like a sign of good discipline. And I know that something from, because I remember speaking to you around the time when you were first initially building up NTB Fitness. And one of the things that I was most impressed with at the time that I thought at that, at that time, I remember thinking this is going to be something that's really successful is that I remember you saying to me, I think we'd met up for a coffee or something. And you said, I'm going to spend 12 months just building and growing a community and just working on like giving them some value, helping people out, seeing how it grows. And, and like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell anything. There's like, there's going to be none of that. It's all going to be about like, building this community like talk to us about that because that now in hindsight is like yeah that's a no-brainer decision because when you look at how big it's grown now it was like well yeah of course it's worth spending 12 months but at the time and to most people you speak to day to day telling them that they're going to have to delay that gratification for 12 months is going to be a nightmare for people isn't it like (laughs) talk, talk to us about like how 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 did you think through that how were you able to sort of stick to it as a discipline like because would have been very easy to get three months in and go oh let's see if I can just sell this or just offer that or like just talk to us about that time because I remember hearing that that conversation at the time and thinking this is different to what people normally do so I think Probably, part, I, I remember, I do, I've forgotten about that. It's quite nice hearing these things. So I've not thought about them. I've not prepped that much for this either. So it's quite nice asking the question and then thinking back to it. So first of all, the idea of building an audience first for 12 to 18 months before selling anything was a Gary V thing. And right. I think, again, I'm, I'm not diagnosed as autistic. So if anybody's listening to this, who is, like I'm not playing around with it, but I have a lot of traits of somebody on the spectrum. So I listened to Gary V and he said, build something for 12 to 18 months before you sell anything. And to me, that was just absolutely black and white. So there was no gray area in that for me to go, yeah, he said that, but he probably means six months. He was like, do this. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. So the way like, I didn't even think about it. And I don't particularly mind delayed. I prefer having a goal and then working towards it. I really enjoy the process of building towards something. In fact, on that note, I'll probably tell another story later, but one of my goals was to get a blue Jaguar F-Type, and that was a goal for about five years, and then I achieved that. I've sold the car since. I'm a proper petrol head. Um, but there's a bit... Remind me to tell you a bit of a story about that afterwards, because that was interesting. Um, but I don't mind working towards something. You know, more to the point, I love working towards something, so I've never really thought 12 months is too long. You just kind of crack on and do it. Um, so the way that I did it was I guess spent 300 quid a month of my own PT income on Facebook advertising. And that was purely going into getting page likes, I think they were called at the time. So for people to follow my audience. So I did that for 12 to 18 months. I set up a daily email list. So I started sending daily emails out to that audience as well and just kind of grew it over that 12 to 18 month time. Um, I don't, I can't, I couldn't tell you why I was disciplined and did it because I remember on those three days, I would go to my local coffee shop, Java in Upper Mill for anyone who's local, sit in the back of my laptop and 
through, I think probably a little bit of embarrassment because my first online business had failed. I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. I think Sophie, my other half, knew what I was doing. My mum and dad probably did, but not in, in none of my clients, no one knew what I was doing. They just know I was sat in the back of Java on my laptop with my headphones on for hours end. Um, and I'll, some of my mates will joke at me because if I'm in Java, I'll have my headphones on and I hate getting disturbed. So it's just a running joke that if I've got my headphones on, don't talk to me. Um, and I think I can be a little bit rude sometimes in coffee shops because people will start to talk to me and they'll get very blunt sort of one word answers. But again, probably just the way my brain works. This is work time not chatting time if i've got an hour in the diary to our social time i'll sit and chat like this podcast is just purely about chatting but i find it hard i it's not that i find it a chore to sit down and work i actually find it harder if i know that this is two hours of working i find it harder to be distracted from that if that makes sense yeah um, so yeah I built it up for 12 to 18 months and then around nine months in my audience were really asking me to build some kind of program so I started to build what turned into the 12 week MTB fitness program I think I had an audience of about 20,000 people on Facebook and an email list I could check the exact number I think it'd be about three or four thousand people um launched that and then I think at a time I did something like two grand in sales in three hours. And then my phone was just like, ding, 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 ding. And I ended up doing about 10 grand in three weeks, something like that. And that was just like, pardon my French, holy shit. <laughs> 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 because like, you know, you earn really good money as a PT. You can earn four or five grand a month. But just to earn like 10 grand in a matter of a few weeks was just absolutely mental and I remember me and Sophie were saving for a house and then over that next 12 months I didn't draw any income from it and there were probably three times where I'd like take a dividend of like seven grand and 12 grand and four grand or whatever and send it to Sophie and Sophie was just like it's just crazy like it pretty much like built our house deposit up um but yeah a lot of that the only reason i got that many sales is because i've given people free content every single day twice a day for that 18 months so people would just wanted to buy something from me and not someone else i think the other side of it as well is that i'm in a niche where there wasn't much competition either so mountain bike is needing to improve the fitness it wasn't like there was a thousand other people to go to so that right. helped as well yeah yeah it was about you, you did well positioning yourself there but again you've you know it, i still don't think it's down to luck that like that was very strategic and it was still linked back to you were you were passionate about it as well because if someone else had come in and tried to do that just because they saw a gap they wouldn't have made of it what you have because you've got that underlying passion for it haven't you you are truly a mountain biker like you would describe yourself as a mountain biker, not someone oh, who yeah. a bike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah. like that is it's it's in you through and through. So that's that's like the big, big difference. Um, and then sort of I, I think it'd be interesting to know then. So how have things changed for you then now then in terms of developing that business? Like what have you had to learn along the way? Where does PT fit into things now? Like I know people love to hear what that transition's like because it's something that the people do do desire to do at some point yeah yeah so at the time i was still a pt three days a week when i launched mtd fitness and i didn't drop any days for i think about two years something like that and um, i just kept building mtb fitness on the other three days so the way that i built it up was as i would get more sales i would spend more on advertising that I'd, on facebook that would bring in more sales so i'd spend more and it kind of built and built like that then over a matter of probably two or three years, it got to a point where I was spending more on advertising and it was growing. And then it got to a point where it would plateau. And the way that Facebook ad spend is, it doesn't necessarily mean that the more you spend, the better results you get. You usually get to a point where actually the cost per result will increase. So you might mm -hmm. spend five grand a month as a random number. And to get to that point, you've been getting better and better results. But then going beyond that, you can spend six or seven or eight grand and still get the exact same results. So... It took me a period of about two years, probably, to figure out how to break through the cycle. So 80% of MTB Fitness as a business was selling the 12-week program. Now, my initial plan was to sell a 12-week program. And as a PT, we all know that you don't keep following the same program over and over. So I sold a 12-week program originally for 30 quid and then increased the price to 50 quid over a couple of price jumps. Um 
to me, it was, and to you guys, it was obvious that you would do a 12 week program. Then you would do a new program, an advanced program for 12 weeks. Then you would do another program. Well, the customer doesn't think that they bought the 12 week program for 50 quid. And then loads of people have repeated it 15 times. So they'll just do it back to back to back or they'll do it from January to May. Then they'll ride through the summer and then do it from October to, you know, to May or whatever. And they'll just repeat the same program. So I was earning money from people but only once or twice. Mm. So the way that I thought of breaking through that, that would be to release new products. So I started writing like books essentially. So I've got one which is 50 tips for mountain bikers over 50. So that's, that still sells really well to this day. So these are all just eBooks. Um, and I thought, right, I'm going to bring out more. So I did a nutrition book and a e-bike guide and various guides like that. But they only sold so much because they're only cost 10 quid. It still wasn't growing me. So probably for a, a couple of years up until February this year, I was stagnating. So I was earning a really good income, paying for the mortgage, you know, having holidays and everything that we want to have, but it wasn't growing. Um, so I realized what I needed was some kind of recurring revenue rather than just selling one-off products every single day. So I'd always wanted to do an app, but if you've ever looked at an app, they're ludicrously expensive to get your own app made to a good quality. You're talking a hundred grand outlay and then a hundred grand a year to maintain it. And again, not to get a basic app because people won't subscribe and pay to a basic app. It needs to be great. So that was either a matter of get investment or get a loan, neither of which I wanted to do. So the catalyst was a couple of things, actually. So like I said, I've been stagnating for a couple of years earning a really good living, but I wanted to do better. And I'd always thought in my thirties, that's when I'll be doing a million pound a year. That's when I'll be really, really successful. And that's when I'll have, you know, 20,000 customers or whatever. And I'd always thought it was something that had happened in my thirties. And then in November last year, I turned 30 <laughs> and I was like, Oh, now I'm 30. I feel exactly the same nothing's going to change in my 30s. It's going to be exactly the same as the 20s. So it was kind of creeping up on 30. And then I had some dreadful news that one of my clients got terminal cancer and she was told she had 12 months to live. And those two things combined. And I was like, I really need to make this happen now. So I'd always talked about doing an app as something that I'd do in the future. And those two things, knowing that you could die 30 years before you're going to die. And also thinking... I'm 30 now. It's the same as the last 10 years. Nothing is just going to change because of another number. Rather than talking about building an app, I started to look at alternatives. So I was like, right, I'm just going to research. So like I say, slightly autistic. So I started researching apps, which meant I researched it. So I read about 100 pages on Google, um, you know, every single word. And I got it down to about three companies that are basically white label app, fitness apps. So that's essentially an app where the company runs it and then you put your content on it and it's still got your logo on it. People download it, but you don't manage it. So they manage it for you. Not dissimilar to Shopify, if anyone's familiar with that. So Shopify is like the website platform that I use. They have thousands of employees that manage the web platform. And then I just stick my brand in on top of that. Same kind of principle, but fitness app for trainers. So researched that for about six weeks, decided on Trainerize, which is the platform that I use in December. Then I just worked for about three months to build the app, launched it in February, and it's just kind of like blown up from there. So I think I'm four months on from launch now and we're at 1,200 people subscribing to that. And it's just growing every week at the moment. But this is the difference now where I'm doing 30, 40% more revenue than I was this time last year. But the, also the difference now is because it's recurring, it's growing. I can see that this is going to keep going. There's, um, yeah, there you go. Can't even remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> neither, neither can I. But I think that there's some real good things in there for people to hear about recurring revenue, building, growth, and going through that transition of going, I've got a great product, but maybe it's not positioned quite right. And maybe it's not right for the customer. And, and there isn't, well, not just right for the customer but right for you there isn't a win for the customer and a win for you to see that growth going up hmm. and you've gone through those kind of almost like an evolution of the product to get it to get it to the right place hmm. it has it has to work for you as well 
Yeah. Yeah, one hundred percent. And and it was working for me. Like I say, it was selling every day. I was earning a really good limit living from it. Um, you know, I'm, I now just do one morning of PT a week. I think I have about four clients that I see once a week. So you know, I really don't do that for the money. It's just because I enjoy seeing my clients. Um, so it was working for me in that way, but it wasn't getting me to where I wanted to go. Um, and as well, it was working for the customer in one way in that it was cheap. It was for 50 quid one off and they could repeat it. But then it wasn't in other ways in that technology is moving on now. People want an app where they can record the weight, record the, you know, the reps. They want to open it up and see the videos all in one place. They want to track the body weight and do all those kind of things. And with a PDF, they obviously weren't able to do that. So an app is much better for the customer and it's much better for me because people are paying monthly for it. So mm. it just works for both people. And it also, like, I hadn't just come up with the idea of an app. Obviously, I'd seen other people doing it, but on a weekly basis, people would email me being like, have you ever considered doing that? Because I would definitely sign up for it. So I'd had about 18 months of customers who were paying me, telling me to do one. Um, and I put out a survey, actually, before I launched the app to my current email list, asking who would join up for an app. And I got about a thousand people saying, yeah, they would sign up. So I was like, yo, this is just a no brainer. Right? <laughs> we got to so, do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And just because I know there's going to be lots of trainers listening to this that are just going to have literally just had the mind blown at the fact you've just told them you've got 1200 people paying you a monthly fee. <laughs> Something they're going to want to know is, is like, what, what do you give them? Like how, because again, a PT's mindset is always individualized programs, individualized this. We work with people one-to-one. -one. Obviously, you have to mm -hmm. go beyond that at some point. So just give people an insight into the type of content that your subscribers get through an app like that, just so that we can at least open people's minds a bit to maybe what they could one day go and create or something like that. Because at the minute, they're probably very sort of, I, I'm not sure how that would work because I can't work with that many yeah. clients. <laughs> No, I totally, totally get it. And as well, I think that my approach, which is to do it low priced, so it's fifteen ninety nine a month, um, and giving everybody the same programs. Obviously, I'll explain how that works. Won't work for the majority of mountain bikers because the only way that I'm able to do that is because I've built an audience over seven years. And, you know, there's half a million people who follow me on Facebook, 150,000 on Instagram. And then I've got a big email list as well. So I have a large audience from which to get 1,200 customers. Yeah. Most people, almost everybody listening, probably won't have an audience of, you know, that size. They might have a 1,000 followers. So for the vast majority of PTs that I imagine are listening to this podcast, they will be much better charging 200 pound a month and working one-to-one -one with 30 online clients i think that will probably work for the majority so i think the worst thing that people could do listening would be for a pt who's got 500 followers to start something charging 15.99 a month because it's going to be incredibly difficult to get it to any kind of scale i think for most people they will be better doing something that's more one-to-one -one, charging 200 quid a month and working online with people um so with that being said, the way that I do it, it's $15.99 a month. Um, they obviously get the app. Everything is inside the app. Um, there are three programs a week to follow. Gym plans, three programs a week. Home plans that they follow. And I update those plans every four weeks. So the way that it works in the past is people would do the 12-week program, but they would all be at a different point. So Sandra will be on week one of the 12 week program. Mike would be on week two of the advanced program and they'd all be at different places. So I had a Facebook group where lots of people could talk to each other, but they were at different points. And another thing that people would do is customers is they would follow the plan for five weeks and they get ill for a week and they wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't know whether to go back a week or whether they should just continue where they were. And people are just end up repeating the start of the program over and over and over again because they didn't know what to do. So I changed that with the app in that you open the app and you follow what plans are there right now. So it doesn't matter if you've had six weeks break, if you've had six months break, you just open it and you do plan one, plan two, plan three, either in the gym or at home that week. And then when they change after a month, you just follow the new plans. So people can access the old plans if they want, but it kind of gets rid of any of that paralysis by analysis that we talked about before because they just open it and press plan one gym and then they do the workout. And then I periodize that over a period of months so that I know that they're doing various different rep ranges and things like that over a longer period of time. Um, 
So yeah, that's how I work it. The other important thing, I've got a Facebook group as well, which is exclusive. I've got a big Facebook group with 25,000 members, something like that. But the only thing with that is you might have 300 people at any one time following the 12 week program. They would post in that group, but then 20,000 other people who aren't doing the program would see the question. So I've made a separate group, which is private only for people on the app. And then they're all following the same programs together. So they'll post being like, Oh, devil's chair this week was horrible. And then five other people will jump on saying, Oh yeah, it was minging on it. So you kind of have that community as well of like 800 odd people that can talk to each other as they're moving through. So that really helps. So yeah, that's how I do it. But like I say, I really want to stress if I was in the position that I think most people listening to this were in and I wanted to increase my income, I would charge much more two, 300 quid a month and I would do much more personal, but online would be the approach I would take. I think there was some really like really good takeaways in there that you just mentioned through because I worked out the numbers as you were going through that and the conversions are like one to two percent from a massive audience down to yeah, a, yeah. a low price product which i think a lot of people don't understand is that those conversions are quite small so even if your products not not to kind of say it's cheap on the cheaper end but if it's on that end of you know 15 20 30 quid a month you need a massive audience and if you're not willing to put the time in like you obviously have to generate that audience then the the better option is more of a personalized programming structure which will pay you more um and then I love the simplicity. Like, I love the way you got it down to like, look, it's simple. It's all about making it easy for the consumer to come in and go, here's where you are. Here's what to do. That's it. Like that gets lost sometimes, especially with online training. I think you're hundred percent right. Like getting it to where a person can log in, follow the program that's there this week. Don't worry about what's going on. Just get started again. Yeah, Brilliant. absolutely. And I think on that note, I think a lot of PTs who post content online, like, particularly people who just get started they talk in ways to try and impress other trainers so they'll do a post and talk about how this works the gluteus maximus and this and that and the other and i never ever use any terms like that i'm just like this is an rdl and it's going to help you get into the attack position on the bike you want to feel it on the back of your legs and here's how you do it so it's much more simple for people to understand and content that i put on social media is even more simple than that um, whereas i think some people just think they have to use all these complicated terms for from you know the early PT days and you never ever have to say the Latin of a muscle ever <laughs> your, your clients do not care if anything it puts them off because they just get confused because like latissimus dorsi what you're on about oh right you want to pull this bar down towards me right okay I can do that um, <laughs> so I think that's part of the reason people like following me for that reason because I keep things simple yeah definitely that's that's really good advice Something I'd, I'd put in the notes to you before we uh, we schedule the interview was in terms of tasks that you now deliver, because I know now you're scaling and you're getting bigger. How have you managed the process of eliminating shitty tasks that you don't need to do anymore, delegating some tasks? So that includes maybe hiring staff and, and um, anything you've done with that and software and automating some things as well like because i know that's a common question that we get asked all the time because people are just overwhelmed with tasks how have you managed to do that and scale and start to maybe push some of those not lesser tasks but things that other people can do where you can spend your time in better places yeah so um i've I've not got any staff i don't employ anybody i've got no intentions to right Um, i don't particularly i just don't think i have the patience to manage staff so as an example sophie my other half is a teacher and she's just an absolute people person and she loves listening to people she loves helping people like she's on the slt so she's like i'm a senior leadership at school and she just has so much patience and she absolutely loves listening to somebody talk about whatever's going on in their life for 40 minutes and then she loves it and she loves helping whereas I really just don't have the patience for that I don't think I would I could learn how to do it but I've just got no interest in learning how to be a good manager um if I was to ever employ people I think I'd have to employ Sophie first and then she could manage all the staff because they would love her and maybe not not love me (laughs) so I've I've worked it in two ways for me because you're right you can't just have loads of ways I've automated things with software as much as I possibly can 
Right. So that's really important. And I can give you a few examples of things there. And then I employ people. Well, I, I use an accountant and a bookkeeper. So I do not do my own books. So as an example, the system with my bookkeeper, she has direct access or they have direct access to Shopify so they can see all the payments are going in. I use zero that's linked up to all my bank accounts so she can see everything there. And then I've even got it down now where so if I have a subscription to a Weber. This is a really good hack. I was proud of. I don't think anyone else does this. So I've got an automation set up in my email where if my Aweber invoice comes in, I've then got an automation set up within Gmail that it automatically forwards it to another email address, which my accountant has access to. And then she can then put that invoice onto the VAT, whatever she has to do with it. So I don't even have to touch invoices because in the past she was doing all my payroll. And then once a month, she'd send me an email and be like, I need these 200 invoices. And it'd take me about three hours to go through my email, send it over, go through my email, send it over. So that's just one example. But I think it's just looking at ways of automating it. So now it's so easy. An email comes in and Gmail automatically just fires it over to the other place. And then she can access that. So then when I do get a question, I might only she might only ask for three invoices a month that I've not sent her or whatever. So that's just miles easier way of doing it. Um, and I've looked for ways of doing it, ways like that, just the way of actually setting up the website, everything is automated. So it took me a good three weeks to set up. So train the way Trainerize works, they actually have an inbuilt payment method where you can send people to your Trainerize website and they will sign up through Trainerize. Now, I didn't want to do that because... At the moment, I'm already exposed to Trainerize in that if Trainerize flop, I no longer have an app I can sell. So I'm aware of that. And, you know, I've got a few backups in mind if I need them. I didn't want them taking the payments as well, because what I didn't want to do was to build up 10,000 customers all paying through Trainerize. Trainerize go bang. And all of a sudden I've lost all of those monthly payments. So it was more difficult for me to do. But I set it up on Shopify. I use the website called Zapier, which is an automation software to basically build out yeah. the functionality to get Shopify to talk to Trainerize. So it took me about three weeks every single day just trying to figure out how all these things work. But it's now super automated. So to give you an example, if I cancel a customer, so people have to email me to cancel the app. So I cancel that and then it's automated. So I get an email saying this person has been cancelled, you need to remove them from the Facebook group. And then once a day, I just go through the names and remove the people out of the Facebook group. So I've just used pieces of software in various ways to try and automate it. But it's at the point now where genuinely, even with that many customers, the biggest time thing for me is putting out content. So in August this year, I'm getting married and we're going on honeymoon for three and a half weeks to America. Now I'm spending the, ne the next five weeks doing my Facebook content, my Instagram content and my daily emails. And I'm scheduling it all for August. So that's a pretty big job. But then when I'm there, it's only going to take me 30 or 40 minutes every morning to just run the whole of MTB Fitness. And I'll basically be opening my email, replying to the 30 emails I've had from customers that day, going into training rise, replying to the messages. Everything else is just set up. Um, and Facebook ads as well. I spend a lot on Facebook ads. That's essentially your marketing team doing your job for you because I've got maybe 50 ads that are created that are running as we speak and they run 24-7 and put that content like I know I'm going on a bit of a rant now, but Facebook is such an incredible tool where when I first started out, if you were setting up a Facebook ad, you used to have to create an ad, which was, you know, how to get fit for the mountain bike as a post on Facebook. Then you had to go into Facebook ads and you used to have to be something like show it to people who live in the UK who are who follow these 20 mountain bikers. So I could make sure it showed them to the right people. And then Facebook would find those people. Facebook's algorithm is so clever now that I literally just create an ad and then you just post it to write, show it to people in the, in America and in England. And then Facebook just finds the right people. It knows that it needs to find mountain bikers and it finds the right people. It's absolutely mental. So all I need to do is just create the content and then put it on Facebook as an ad. And then Facebook will do it all for you. So if you think, you know, 20 years ago before Facebook, you would have had to go out and try and find all of those people. A massive automation for me from the marketing side of it is Facebook literally just does it for you. It's incredible. 
Yeah, I think this is might be the most um, played back episode we've ever done because every time you speak and give an answer, there's about ten golden nuggets in there. <laughs> but you it's talk so done. fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think people are going to replay this one again and again and again. I never talk um, about this stuff. I only talk about like mountain biking and fitness. Never talk about it. <laughs> so well, good. It's nice to me. <laughs> Glad you've had a chance to kind of sit down and really go through it. But uh, that's really interesting. So you've got some staff on the accounts and ma- and um, bookkeeping side. But apart from that, everything else is automation. Um, yeah, a videographer. So when I'm doing right. videos for customers, there's a guy I use to do the videos. So he'll come in and do you know a few days of filming with me and he edits the videos as well just because i'm crap at that but that's just purely for not my instagram videos that i put on that's purely just for the actual customer videos that go within the app um i can't think of anyone else i use except for that bookkeeper and accounting is the big thing because that's just an absolute time suck and you've got to bear in mind as well like i have customers in 70 countries now the way i don't understand how it works but i know that the website charges vat to different people in different countries um so i would have to go through individually and work out who's paid what and that don't know how to do that not interested in learning my accountant does that for me but i think that is just that could get so complicated if you get 300 people and you've got 30 people who are in different eu countries no idea how you would work out how to pay but my accountant takes pay and care of that and then just sends me an email saying you need to pay this much to these people and i do it <laughs> so that's an essential hire that's somebody you had to have there to to sort all that out makes sense can i i'm gonna ask you a sideways question because you said you're getting married this year honeymoon obviously you've been with your partner for a long time family friends all that kind of stuff how do they cope with and how has it impacted those people with you being obviously very focused with your work and sometimes being that person with the headphones on and going get away from me because i like you can see the the kind of fruits of your labor are really good aren't they because when you get into it you said you spent three weeks sorting out an, an automation between a couple of different things and really got into it. And every time you do those things, it seems like you get really immersed. How do your family and friends get impacted by that? And do they now, have they kind of got used to that and see the benefits long-term and, and understand that's who you are? Cause I, I reckon a lot of people would get a lot of not negative feedback, but kind of lose the momentum because they get distracted and they yeah, get told no, about, I get you. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably two sides of it. I think there's my relationship with Sophie, and then there's friends. So, for the friends side of it, I don't have many friends. I'm not that much of a social person anyway. So I've got a few people that are friends who I go mountain biking with, and then I've got Ozzy, who's my best mate, who I'll see once or twice a week for a coffee or to go for a bike ride. He just understands like if it's work that you know we might meet for an hour for coffee in Java, and then he'll do some work on his laptop or I'll carry on. So we'll generally schedule right. Let's go for a coffee for an hour, an hour and a half. But he's busy anyway. Like he has client, he has ten clients a day every day. So you know he doesn't have. I've probably got more time than him. So I don't have a big friends group. So I suppose if you're the type of person who wants to maintain a friendship with 20 people, maybe it'd be more difficult. I'm not that person. Like I'm quite happy on my own. I love to spend time with Sophie. I love to have a few close friends. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. For you, you know who you are. You know who you are is the answer to that, isn't it? Yeah. I think that's a big takeaway from, from that bit. Yeah. This, this links yeah, in exactly. nicely to something I was going to ask you, Matt, because I know, I know that a few people learn this the hard way. Like I, I got a taste of this myself is that what are the realities of running a business like this? Because I know that some trainers have all these aspirations for like going online, going for this freedom route. And then when they step away from training people, it's maybe not all it seems like. Yeah. talk someone through like even if they're not going to reach the level you're at at the moment like what what are the realities of running like a completely you know online business where you probably may be spending more time on your laptop a day than people appreciate yeah. and stuff like that yeah it's very isolating so i just real quick before i answer that you ask i think what i don't want to paint a picture of is that i'm an absolute workaholic who works 14 hour days because i'm not so <laughs> like I'm, I'm every night sophie works more than me genuinely like she's a teacher she marks until nine o'clock at night um but i will generally work from about seven or eight a.m till about four p.m every day that tends to be my work period then i'll go to the gym i'll go for a ride and then my evening is generally free so i really don't 
don't want people to picture that I'm an Elon Musk working all the time because that isn't me. I find that when I get to about three, four o'clock, my brain just stops working because right. most of the work that I do is creating content that people need to enjoy and people need to enjoy reading. And it's not just a matter of cranking it out because as soon as I get to a certain point, my brain goes to mush and I can't do anymore. So I generally work till about four o'clock, something like that. Then I go on my bike or I'll go to the gym. And then the evening is generally free. I spend it with Sophie. Sophie might be working, so I'll play on my phone or watch TV or read or whatever. Um, and then generally weekends are free. I'll do a couple of hours work on a Saturday, maybe 20 minutes work on a sat on a Sunday morning, but usually not. And the rest of the time is free. So when you said about how it impacts Sophie, she probably has some anxiety about me being self-employed and you know not having a secure job because she's a teacher but we've been together for 10 years and obviously she sees the fruits of the labor so she's much less worried about that about that nowadays um but yeah that answers that question because i think it's important i don't want to paint a false picture of who i am and my work life that just it isn't true i think i've got a really good work life balance i was working way more when i was a full time pt getting into yeah. the gym at 7 a.m. and leaving at 9 p.m. seven days six days a week um so yeah that was that side of it so i was thinking about this before i came on the podcast to actually answer your question um i think a lot of people aspire to have an online business and have no idea what it is actually like you spend the vast majority of time on your own um, it's very isolating, it's difficult, and you have to be a bit of a geek. So when I was a kid, I was just a computer geek. So like I said, I got bullied in school. I used to walk home, and then I used to get into my bedroom at 4 p.m. at night, shut the curtains, and then I used to be a gamer at night. I used to build my own computers. I used to be a gamer. I was just a proper computer geek. Like, I absolutely love computers and the internet. So I love being on my laptop. Like, I get I'm probably right in between an introvert and an extrovert where I can talk to anybody. I enjoy talking to people, but I also find it quite tiring. So when I do three or four clients on a Thursday morning, that tires me out. And by the end of it, it's my zen to sit on my laptop. Now, someone like Ozzy, my best mate, obviously, Matt, you know him, he is an absolute social butterfly. He just needs to be around people 24-7. So he can finish work at 8 p.m. And if Anna is or the half isn't at home, he'll go to his mum's house to have a chat with his mum for an hour before he goes to bed. Now, to me, that is so far beyond how I could live my life. Like, I will just be miserable. Like, I love spending time with people, but I also need time on my own. And, you know, every day I spend the majority of it on my own. So today, Sophie went to work at seven. I'm going for a bike ride with a mate later. Um, but the most of my day is on, on my own. So I think there's a bit of a disconnect between people who become a PT because they love chatting to people and love spending time with people and then thinking they want an online business. And actually the reality of having an online business is probably very different than many of them think it is. Like, I don't think somebody like Ozzy, for example, would thrive working on his computer every day because he loves being around people and he's better at that as well. Like he's much more successful working with people all the time. Whereas mm. for me, working full-time as a PC is probably a bit too much one-to-one -one time for me which again ties into why I don't want to have employees because then I'd have to be with people every day <laughs> <laughs> so it just comes that, back to that, knowing I... yourself doesn't it like Paul said earlier you've got to you've got to sort of know yourself and understand what your strengths are and things like that that's clearly a big part of it and it it sounds almost like you're like if you were going to sort of distill down what your full-time job is now because you've mentioned it a few times is it's almost like you're a content creator now that's yeah. that's your job basically day to day is I create content to continue you know fueling this vehicle that I've built yeah yeah 100 I would agree with that that takes up the vast majority of my day like I say when I go on honeymoon I will only have to work for 30 minutes a day that's like I can keep the business going with 30 or 40 minutes and it'll continue to grow if I do that as long as I put out the content it's the content side of things that takes the most time and being honest Matt do you look forward to that 30 40 minutes that you're going to get to go on and, uh, <laughs> speak to and do the yeah, yeah no yeah I do enjoy that yeah I'll enjoy that <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In the that's morning, a weird... Sophie's getting ready. I will. I will enjoy doing that. But I also, I don't have any issues um, switching off either. Um, although I say that you guys are probably the same. You, you think about business all the time, don't you? Like yes. I know I do. I'm sure you guys do. Like yes. I never. I can't imagine having a job that is nine till five, 
I can't possibly imagine not thinking about business at 10 o'clock at night while I watch TV. Like you just think about it all of the time. Um, but in a good way, like it's a hobby, not in a way that it's like I'm stressed out about work. I'm thinking about how I need to cover this bill. Like I think anybody who is a business owner, who's a successful business owner, who's done it for a long time, is obsessed with it. Um, it's just a game that you're playing, isn't it? It's a, it becomes a game and you're just trying to game. find, yeah, you're trying to get better at the game. You're trying to, not win the game per se, but stay in the game and yeah, you know, yeah. keep going with it and stuff like that. So I think that's that's yeah. really important. Before I forget, because it will slip my mind, I know we're coming up to an hour. We need this story about the the blue F type, was it? Oh yeah, got about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need so to slip I'm that a, in before we finish. <laughs> I'm an absolute petrol head, so I love cars. I still love cars today. Um, and round about the time that I set up MTV Fitness, the Jaguar F type was released, and I remember watching the Jeremy Clarkson video of it, and my mind just being blown. I was like, oh my god, I need this car. And it was a car that was, you know, in reach. It was like, I don't know. 70 grand new it's not like a 300 grand ferrari that feels like something that i definitely want to achieve as a petrol head but that's down the line in the distance um so i'd had this dream of getting the f-type and that had been the goal that was on my mind build up the business we had sophie had always said yeah you're not getting an expensive car until we've got a house because we're renting at the time which was good solid advice so sensible yeah. <laughs> so i was like right i need to build up my income i need to get a house and a pension and all of those like things and then i can get the car so we got the house had the pension and i was like my uh, pcp on my car at the time was coming up so i was like right it's time to get the f-type and i got it and it was everything i'd hoped for i remember buying the car turning up um and we looked through like the window we were there it was right in the middle of the pandemic so the guy was a bit like why that you could tell he was just like why are you buying this car in the middle of the pandemic but my business wasn't affected by it um and i remember looking and thinking like oh my god this is amazing and sitting signing the you know the finance details and whatnot and he started the car up in the background and, goes, <laughs> and then uh on the drive home like because i love like to a petrol head i don't know if you guys are into cars but it's all about the noise we uh we drove through a tunnel and I remember there was an Audi R8 in front of me and I got to the tunnel, put the windows down, dropped it down a few gears and I floored it through the tunnel and the tunnel erupted with noise. And I was like, oh, that's so annoying. The R8 has like floored it instead of me. And then I did it again and I was like, oh my God, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> so like I was loving it and it was everything that I wanted it to be. But I had a period of about two weeks after where I felt really, really low. And I think it's because for seven years, the aim had to be to get the F-type and I did it. And then it wasn't even a conscious thing. I was like, oh, this is worse than I was expecting. Like, you know, I absolutely loved it. And kids have run up to you at streetlights being like, rev it, rev it, which is fun. Um, but I definitely had a period of a couple of weeks of being like low. And it wasn't because I didn't like the car. I think it was because there's so much joy in aiming to achieve something that actually it's so cliche but the path of building up is way more fun than actually achieving the thing and that doesn't mean that the achieving the thing isn't great and it's not that i was aiming for the wrong thing because i did genuinely love the car it was just because there's something about when you've got something to work at it kind of goes back to what we we're saying about delaying gratification for 12 months it's just as fun to think about how amazing it's going to be to do that and then to get that one win today that takes you a step forward that really is just as fun as actually achieving the thing um and you know of course i've got other goals now that i want to work towards but i thought it was really interesting i did have a period of about two weeks where i felt really low afterwards and it wasn't because i thought consciously oh this is crap i don't like this car it was just Oh, I've achieved it now. That dream that I had for seven years. I remember on the way into Profit, actually, I'd always wanted a fancy car. And I'd be there driving along in my clapped out Clio. And it had one street, like one light that popped up to the sky like Batman because I ripped it off driving it and couldn't afford to fix it. And I'd be driving along dreaming about driving my sports car one day. And it had been like, you know, seven, 10 years in the making. And then I'd done it. And it was it wasn't an anticlimax, but it did definitely. I wasn't expecting to feel down after it. Yeah, yeah. I know that because you mentioned Gary Vee earlier on, and I know that one of his goals is to buy the New York Jets. And he talks yeah. about the worst day of his life will be when he buys the New York when Jets. When he buys it. Yeah, he yeah, knows, he yeah. knows it ahead of time. And he, I think he's, he's also said publicly a few times he kind of hopes he never gets there. He's, he's like made it so that 
the chances mm. of him doing it are actually quite slim, even for someone like yeah. him. But he, he's very much aware of that. He's like, that could be the worst day of my life. I think on that point, I think that's why it's so important to love what you're actually doing. Because like, I love MTV Fitness and I love working on it every day. But I can't imagine if I'd worked as a banker and hated every day of my life to earn this car. I can't imagine finally achieving it, getting the car and then being like, oh, I've built a life that I don't like. Like I was lucky that I got the car and achieved it. But really, I loved my life as well. I loved the business I was doing. I just carried on doing it. So it wasn't like I was going back to something I didn't enjoy. You know, I loved it. Yeah. That is a superb place to finish off this episode. <laughs> and I've gen genuinely, I think this has been one of the most enjoyable episodes I've ever done. Um, Just listening to that journey over the last seven, eight years, whatever it's been. And your honesty and all your insights and everything today, I think it's been class, mate. And uh, can't... oh, what do you drive now? Well, I've got a uh, M4 now, BMW M4, you know, the new one with the massive beaver teeth at the front. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's bright, bright yellow as well. So uh, um, I was looking for colours and I loved the bright yellow. And I was like, people are going to think I like a right knob in that. And then Sophie said, <laughs> Sophie's proper strong minded. She was like, if you like it, you drive it because that's what you like it. Screw everybody else's opinion. So um, you get some people who absolutely love it and some people who just despise it. Um, but the one benefit is I can get the bike in the back now, which is meant because I can go for a good drive in the car and I can get the bike in, whereas the F-Type obviously didn't fit. <laughs> no, not at all. Love it. Um, and going back to knowing who you are, that's what you love. Yeah, yeah. So for, for anybody who wants to get a hold of you and, and look at your program and everything, just let everyone know where they can find you, what your handles are, and... Um, yeah, brilliant episode today, pal. Oh, cheers. No, it's been wicked talking to you all, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about business. If you ever want me to come on again, just give me a shout. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I talk too much and too fast. Um, but yeah, for people who um, who want to follow me, just Google MTB Fitness and it'll come up. So it's MTB as in mountain bike. So mountain bike, MTB. If you're a mountain biker, you know the term MTB, but most people who aren't don't. So it's MTB Fitness. So the website is mtb.fitness on Instagram. I think it's at mtb.fitness, but if you put MTB Fitness, it'll come up. And then on Facebook, just search MTB Fitness. Um, but yeah, just drop me an email or a message anytime to everybody listening. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great. Really appreciate it today, pal. And yes, we will probably have you back on in the future talking about all things and all successes that you've uh, progressed to. So thanks for today. Sounds good to me. Cheers to that, guys. Speak to you next time. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the ProFit Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Campy, and I'm here with my always regular co-host, Matt Robinson. How are you doing, pal? Very good, mate. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, we've had a good week this week. We've done a live education for all the coaching clients we have, which has gone down a storm. And today we've got um, a really good guest. Just as we signed off, um, it was one of the most enjoyable episodes I've ever done, and I'm sure Matt will agree. He talks super fast. He's got tons of knowledge. It's a, a guy called Matt Mooney who runs N MTB Fitness. And um, I, I think this is going to be one of the most replayed episodes we've ever done. Wouldn't you agree? I do, yeah. I do also think it'll be the only podcast episode ever to be played on less than one time speed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might have to slow you might have to slow the speed down to actually get all the knowledge bombs out. What what you get from listening to Matt is he's like his passion, he's you know, he he's he's been in the industry a long time, he still loves it, he's still got places he wants to go. Really inspirational journey, like ups, downs. Paul mentioned just as we uh, stopped the recording, like how honest he was as well. So, like genuinely sit in, listen. There's so many things to take from today's episode and Matt's story that as a as a fitness business owner, that it's really inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. Get get your notepad out, like like Matt said. Slow the recording down potentially because you'll wanna you'll wanna do that and get all the knowledge that Matt's got to give, and uh, enjoy Matt Mooney. <laughs>